Hello and welcome to Renew, the show about the College of Forest Resources at Mississippi State University. The College of Forest Resources supports and enables the management and wise use of our natural resources. I'm your host, Leslie Berger. Today's show will feature the Department of Forestry, one of the three units within the College of Forest Resources. And here to represent that unit today is Dr. Steve Grado. Thank you for joining me today, Steve. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm glad you're able to come. Um, part of our mission within the College of Forest Resources is to conserve natural resources. And you have a slightly different approach to that. So could you just give me sort of a thumbnail sketch of how you take this idea of conservation of natural resources and, and use it uh, to develop a program in the Department of Forestry? Well, I was trained as a um, forest economist mm -hmm. and I've sort of morphed over the years into a natural resource economist and uh, it's not that I don't work directly with timber but I do um, I have an economic slant on recreation wildlife urban and community forestry and those are the areas that I've really uh, developed my research program in primarily and then I have a little sidebar um, of human dimensions type work mm -hmm. that I've done in the urban and community forestry area and um, also with forest industry. And I would say the foundation of a lot of my work has been surveys, um, mail surveys, face-to-face -face surveys. Uh, I, I would hardly want to guess how many surveys I've done. It'll okay. be 23 years July 1st. Wow and uh, we get a lot of data back. Some of the surveys are difficult and we've done a lot of uh, experimentation with the uh, surveys. I will say, even though I'm in the Department of Forestry, that my, I've made a living with the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, <laughs> and Agriculture because I've done work with many individuals in that department over the years right. and I'm, I'm on the verge of another great project right Excellent. now with a new faculty member. Perfect. Well, so we were talking before the show started Many people perhaps don't recognize that you can actually assign an economic value to natural resources, whether we're talking about the economic value of white-tailed deer or waterfowl or urban trees. So could you explain that just a little bit more? Yeah. Most of the work I've done has been based on um, a particular type of software, not the only kind, where you do economic impact analysis. And that tracks uh, spending by individuals, groups, industries, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or whatever, mm -hmm. and the ripple effect of those dollars and, and um, where they're spent, how much of them stay in, in the area that we're studying and how much leaves that area. Mm -hmm. So that is basically an, an economy-based analysis. What you can also do is a lot of this willingness to pay uh, methodologies, um, and my graduate student will be talking about one of those methodologies um, to you later, but uh, contingent valuation uh, method. And there is a way of doing both where you can combine how people feel about things, right. how much they feel they can spend on something with that economic um, uh, economy ripple effect. You can combine them. And, and uh, Kevin Hunt, who is a professor in wildlife, we did an article uh, that was published, research from a graduate student. Um, and we published uh, uh, that very thing, combining um, how people feel about things right. and the value that people place on things that are what we call non-monetary values, and we coupled it with pure monetary values. And it got published. We, we had consulted some experts before we went there, mm -hmm. uh, and they said, boy, this is a great article, and you guys right. are onto something that hasn't been done that often. Right. So from an economic standpoint, then, um, these these sources of money, I mean, these natural resources actually are source of money to a state or, or um, the nation yeah. in a way um, that perhaps is not recognized by even our governmental leaders. Yeah. But in the absence of conservation, in the absence of wise use, um, that's actually dollars lost from our economy. And yes. That's what you're trying to pin down is just that economic value of those resources. With, with a lot of the studies we've done in Mississippi, we can track the industries that are able to absorb the dollars that are spent when people come here and the industries that do not exist, where people either have to buy the stuff before they come or they buy it after they leave. And so it's a great... Um, tool to use if you want to talk about developing um, some rural 
uh, development of some sure. industries that could support our resources, mm -hmm. which would be more taxes, which would be more money for our wildlife um, and, and forestry departments and agencies. Right, or just local economies. You know, yeah, if you put a bed and breakfast in big. there for a, um, say, a hunt club or a, yep. or a wildlife viewing opportunity, that's money in that local economy that helps Ab stimulate absolutely. that local economy. Absolutely, yep. And we can pinpoint that with the, with the type of software that we use. And, you know, my, my most famous study was the white-tailed deer where I did it five years in a row, uh, funded by the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks. And then I also had funding to do a graduate student for one of those years. So we had two coinciding studies and they both came out with the same result. The white-tailed deer hunting now, this is not how it, you and I might feel about it as an experience. Mm -hmm. It's about a billion dollar industry. Wow, that's a lot of money. Yeah. That's a lot of money. And I uh, referred to, at the time <clears throat> to my friend Dave Godwin, who was working for the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fish and Parks. I said, Dave, you know, you worked on this project. He was on the graduate students committee. I said, you know the numbers. You've seen the work we've done. Has this been used? And he said, yeah, we, we bring it up often um, right. in hearings uh, in front of the legislature yeah. at times. And of course, I've heard Dr. Keenum refer to this study several times right. in some of his talks. That's good to have that, that impact. I'm looking forward to learning more about your research when we return after break. We'll be meeting with graduate student Eric Bridges to learn a little about the work he's been doing with Dr. Grado. Want a career as big as the outdoors? Want to have an impact on the environment? College of Forest Resources at Mississippi State University delivers hands-on training, ensuring clean air and water, wildlife habitats, and a sustainable environment. Creating new wood products and retooling old ones for today and tomorrow. Find a career in whatever path you choose majors in forestry, natural resource and environmental conservation, sustainable bioproducts, wildlife, fisheries, and aquaculture. Want a career as big as the outdoors? Choose the College of Forest Resources at Mississippi State University. Discovery. It tells our history and determines our future. At Mississippi State University, we're digging deep, unlocking an understanding of our past, validating it. Middle East exploration by faculty and students is uncovering evidence that unravels ancient mysteries. Scholars have long thought of the biblical kings David and Solomon as mythological figures. Our research offers evidence that supports their existence, boosting MSU into an international league of experts on archaeology. Now we're changing the way people think about the past, opening up new possibilities of understanding for future generations. Digging deeper, learning more. Welcome back to Renew. Joining me now is Eric Bridges, a graduate student in the Department of Forestry. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for having me. So tell me about your path to Mississippi State University. So I was working in the Memphis area as a city forester for a small community. Uh, I'd been there about 12 years and I knew it was time for something, the next step of my career. And mm -hmm. I found in the Journal of Forestry an advertisement for the distance program, Excellent. master's distance program for the CFR. And mm -hmm. So I applied, and when they expressed my interest in urban forestry, they put me with Dr. Grado. And then when we finished the master's program, it just led naturally to a PhD, and we found some funding through the Forest and Wildlife Research Center, right. and now I'm an on-campus PhD student. Excellent. So you mm -hmm. ditched the whole career thing, and now you're pursuing a different That's route. Right. That's right. <laughs> so it's a little scary. It was extremely scary, <laughs> having a family at home and a and a job and all of that, but it's been super rewarding. Really glad I chose this path. Well, excellent. Well, we're glad you're here. Thanks. Glad you're here. So tell me a little about the project that you're doing. Great, yeah. So being in urban forestry, I really wanted to focus on something that related to my practical experience. Mm -hmm. So we're studying the impact of urban forest canopy on property values and specifically 
the research that we just submitted for publication was based in the city of Lakeland, the small community on the east side of Memphis. And mm -hmm. so we're looking at ways that uh, what would be a non-market forest value. So when you're looking at the urban forest, you're mm -hmm. not automatically thinking of timber values. Right. It's not necessarily the thing that pops into your head. You're not going to cut them down and sell them. Right. Urban wood utilization is a thing, but it really comes at the end of the tree's life when we're recycling something that would normally be disposed of. But we're looking at is the value that comes from knowing the trees are there or from having mm -hmm. them in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so our study is based on how properties with tree canopy around them value differently than homes without that tree canopy around them. Mm -hmm. So our, what we found, which was interesting, I thought was interesting, was people were valuing the neighborhood, the forests surrounding their homes, more than the trees on their individual lots. So they really sort of looked at that forest land mm -hmm. um, as a, a real bonus when they were purchasing that home. Sure. And we hope that has some impact on the decision makers in a local community if they were thinking of conservation efforts. Right. Right, because they're, the temptation would be, well, that's just unused land. Correct. So we could just cut down those trees and, and sell them as home right. uh, lots or, right. or, or put some kind of economic development in there. And, right. And what you're saying is your research says that the, the presence of those trees alone, even if they're not on their own property, uh, makes that attractive feature, one that people are perhaps willing to pay even more for? Correct. So what we can say then to um, decision makers, these community decision makers, is this land has value and it can be translated to property tax revenue. So mm -hmm. you may actually want to think hard and even run some scenarios based on our data about whether or not you develop in a traditional land use scenario mm -hmm. with parking lots and homes and commercial sure. versus conservation easements. And, and then it can have other benefits, of course, water quality and recreation and all that. Exactly. But you can actually, what we found, at least from my experience, arguing sort of an economic impact was much more powerful at, city, at the city council level. It is. Yes, we would like for people to make those kind of uh, conservation choices because that's what's good for the environment, right. because it's good for society. But in the end, a lot of times it gets down the dollars. And if you it can really make that does. dollar argument in addition to the others, that's just more power to you. That's right. So. That's right. So where do you see yourself going now? You're finished this PhD and, <laughs> you know, what are you going to do when you grow up? <laughs> when I grow up, I hope to get a real job and I would like to get into academia. I'd like to continue doing research, mm -hmm. but I really love teaching as well. So hopefully academia will will be an avenue I can pursue. Excellent. So is your family is here then? They came with you? Or you so my family there? is in Memphis. My wife's oh. a professor at the University of Memphis. So okay. we just need to start a program there maybe. There you go. <laughs> well, we'll do a little bit of export uh, right. of our expertise. That's well, right. I appreciate you spending time uh, to share a little bit about the project you're doing and I wish you the very best. Thank uh, you for having me. I know it's hard to come back as a returning student. I've been in your shoes. Yes. So I understand that. And I would thank like you. to thank uh, Dr. Steve Grado for also coming by today and sharing what he's doing in the Department of Forestry. I hope you've learned a little bit more about some of the activities in the College of Forest Resources and that you'll join us again in the future. Uh, until then, I encourage you to get outside and enjoy the re resources that we have around us. I've been your host, Leslie Berger, and thank you. Mm -hmm.